Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to take you on a uh, digital journey of places I've been at. But you have to start with the question, how does place become important to indigenous people? What makes place place? And then what about our space within that place? Now, I've been all across uh, North America, and I've been to the center of the universe several times. All the indigenous people say it started right here. You go to Hopi country, it started here. Uh, Haida country, it started here. Lakota country. And I realized that, well, first of all, it couldn't have started everywhere, but what they're saying is that we as a people are tied to what took place in this ancestral place. So that is important because that's where, where your culture is to derive from. But I started thinking about the commonalities of that. Because everywhere I went, I felt connected to their place. And it goes back to our original concept of being the Ongwe Ongwe, the original people of this land. One land, one people, one heart, one mind. Well, think about that. But there are some things that I thought about along the way. So this is for all of you students. Write these down vigorously because this is what the, my lecture is going to be about these next three slides. So if we take a look at, uh, even though our origins do vary, like I said, we either came from the sky, out of the sea, or of the earth. There might be a few spontaneous creation stories here, but this connection, not sometimes when we think of place, we always think about a physical place. But our, our, our place of origin is important. We belong to that place where our ancestors were born. That's very important, the thing that Sue Hill talked about. My dad's a Mohawk, so you could say his clay is from the Mohawk Valley. That's, that's the ancestral homeland of the Mohawk people. But because of my dad's ancestors moved to Grand River, and we've been burying the people there, now that becomes part of my place. My mother, who's a Tuscarora, her people are over in New York. And I have a tie, and I lived there at Tuscarora for about 25 years. So I got a little bit of an emotional dilemma. Where do I want to be buried? With my mother's relatives, like a Tuscarora, where my bloodline comes from, or my father's relatives at Six Nations, where my bloodline also comes from. So rather than deal with that, I don't know, I might just get uh, divide my body in two, send it to different places. So the footprints of our ancestors are felt upon the ground when we call our Mother Earth, and that's very important. We heard about treading lightly, but we do tread on this ground. In fact, we get energy from walking on the ground. And that energy is connected to the fact that our ancestors are buried down in that ground. So cultures uh, are, <clears throat> are placed uh, in these de designated ecospheres. This is, makes the big difference. Why? The Haudenosaunee are the way we are, and why other people are the way they are, because they're attached to a little bit of different environmental matrix. Certain animals, certain keystone species help to define their connection to that place. And then what we find, <clears throat> those places help to best manifest culturally based beliefs, our values, and all of these things that add to this indigenous state of mind. So we're connected to place, place is connected to us, it helps to define us, and we're, we help to define that place. So when you take a look at the sense of place, it's really important to remember that for countless generations of the people who have been to that same place, are connected to that place. And some people are still in their same ancestral place. And I believe then it gets encoded within your DNA. I was at the eye doctor the other day, and uh, they're taking a look at my eyeball. And all of a sudden the woman, she leaned over, and a little embarrassingly she said, are you an Indian? I said, no, I'm not from India. She said, no, are you native? And I said, no, I was born in Buffalo. And she said, no. Yes. Uh, and I said, why are you asking? Uh, she said, something funny. Whenever I look into the eye of a native person, the, around the iris, it looks like a bunch of crystallized feathers in a circle, all pointing in the center. He said, she said, it's the strangest thing. She says, other people's eyes aren't like that. So whenever I see somebody's eye like that, I have to ask that question, are you native? I thought, interesting, a circle of feathers. So that's the encoding in the DNA based upon our culture. By burying our ancestors in that place, like I said, we take we get this spiritual bond because think about that. The love, their mentality, their spirit, it all vibrates in that place. And then when we live there, we get connected to it. So a lot of what we do is unexplainable. It's intuitive. It has to be felt. You can't, you can't describe it. Anthropologists haven't been able to describe this connection to place that we have. It's so profound because it's like as the earth vibrates, your body vibrates with it. And then 
by giving birth in that same place, by birthing the kids on the ground to these coming faces that Sue talked about, an expectation that this relationship will continue is, is gets started again, it gets uh, renewed. So with every generation, we're connected to those old people laying on the ground, and we have this anticipation for the new people coming that our job in the middle is to keep as much of that old stuff, that old thinking, that old way of looking uh, renewed and keep it uh, alive so it has affects the future. So, uh, you know, without going over the whole thing here, but there's a whole lot of stuff that is uh, important to take a look at. And I'm going to leave a copy of this PowerPoint here with the uh, powers to be, so you can feel free to share it with uh, whoever it wants. Uh, but our creation story then visualizes this space. That visualization affects the way we think about ourselves and all of our uh, surroundings. And when you think about it, then uh, we're, our mother's womb is the first environment in which we get socialized or connected to that that place, in that space. How is that? Because we hear the language of our mother and our relatives. We hear the songs that the people sing. We feel it when she dances. We, we, we consume the same kind of food she consumes. So she's, you, when you're in your mother's uh, belly, you're slowly getting ready to enter this space. And it, we refer to it as the dish. Everybody's got this dish full of all of this stuff that defines who their culture is, what their environment's like, and what kind of people they are. And so you're born within that uh, dish. And then how your society's organized helps you relate to what's going on in the dish, with relatives in the dish, with other kind of people. And so being indigenous is all about understanding the uh, intrinsic nature of the relationships to, to place, to people, to space, to the future. So I'm going to take you on this journey of places I've been to that helps me think about all of this stuff. We'll go visit uh, the high desert northwest coast, stop off of the Pueblos in the southwest, a place called Chaco Canyon, and we'll look at Cahokia Mounds in St. Louis, uh, Missouri, which was the largest uh, community of indigenous people in North America, and then we'll talk a little bit about the Haudenosaunee, but I'm going to leave a lot of that for Gido. He's going to really explain what I meant. How many people have been to Haida Gwaii out in British Columbia? Oh man, you got to get out of there. You got to get there. Uh, so, as I say, it's the place between the ocean and the rainforest. That's where the where the hiders are, are living. They have a couple of expressions there I found very important to remember, because this applies to everybody, but it's interesting. In a language which I can't pronounce, everything is connected. It sounds very simple, but it is so profound to remember that everything is connected all of the things that live there. And this other part they talk about, the southern part of the uh, island, is a place of wonder and beauty. And uh, although these are loose translations of the native language, I think it's important to realize that. Wonder, we are in awe of the creation. We don't understand it all. We don't need to understand it all. We don't need to cut open every frog and look at how the frog works. We have to appreciate frogness. We appreciate our sense in that world. And some things happen magically, creates this great sense of wonder. But if you're not there witnessing it, being a part of it, you can't describe it. So that wonder, that magic is important. And then the sense of beauty means, uh, to me, uh, completeness. You feel so complete. You feel it's so much connected to everything. You feel like, oh man, I'm like the luckiest person in the world because I'm in the middle of all of this stuff. And that's what makes it beautiful. These are my tour guides on my digital journey. I was out to uh, Haida country uh, several uh, years ago. And uh, the guy on the far left is Kuja. He actually became the uh, president of the Haida nation and fought against the, uh, the uh, cutting of uh, the logs. But at the time, he was a great uh, singer. And I remember that drum that he had, uh, because I'll show you a picture later. He sang a drum as we were rowing in the canoe. And then this old man, Judson Brown, he was uh, quite a guy. It was interesting we asked questions about protocol. But one thing I've learned about indigenous people, you've got to be very careful. Because especially with these old guys, they like putting you in embarrassing situations. So they'll tell you, you're supposed to do this. That's how you show respect, and then you go do it, and before you know it, everybody's laughing at you, you know, or the old people are chuckling away. Or they'll teach you a phrase that turns out to be, you just called somebody a horse's ass. So you've got to be very careful <laughs> of what to do, because joy sometimes is at the expense of others. But there was this rock where they took us to. A low tide, it just stands there, it's just balancing there. 
high tide, the water comes up around there. I was there with a group of uh, traditional elders from all across North America. And every morning we went out to have our sunrise ceremony at this place, and it was amazing to me. And as you see, this is a uh, quote here, that before the people came, the, the world was covered with water, and still before time. And uh, I can't quite read it on my screen here. There was neither night or day. Supernaturals occupied the first rock that had risen <clears throat> from the sea, the first rock. I'm not saying this is it, but it's amazing when you think about it. So some people worry about indigenous knowledge disappearing because we might lose our language fluency, but I guess I'm here to say indigenous knowledge will never disappear because it's in the rock, it's in the tree, it's in the land, it's in the animals, it's in here in the bones of our ancestors, it's just right here. We gotta do what Bill said, learn how to listen to that. And not to get too freaky, but you gotta learn how to listen to the, to the rock uh, in order to understand uh, that. <clears throat> This is a sculpture of First Man, because everybody's creation story is important, remember. This is a big uh, sculpture done by a guy named Bill Reed. That is one of my favorite pieces, called The Raven and the First Man. So in our creation story, the, this world's kind of already created, but along comes this big raven, he sees this clam shell, he hears these noises, and he starts pecking on it, opens it up, and out comes, I think, uh, seven, seven humans. And um, they all go running off along the shoreline, and uh, they settle it. Seven humans become kind of like the seven large families among the Haida people. Uh, there's another story that ends up with them having sex with clams, but we're not going to get into that. <clears throat> but the idea is that they have to go and start populating the, uh, the landscape. So some of you may run out and get some clams after my discussion, but that's up to you. And what Bill talks about is restoring this harmonious relationship. So Bill is one of the people who kind of brought back Haida art to the Haidas. He said at one point, we've become a lying lot of people. We're supposed to be an ocean people. And this grandeur of the carving has helped to get us connected back to that. So he's wondering, in the chaos in which we live, maybe the reason why we're here today and the reason why we're looking at indigenous cultures is that maybe, as he said, these shining islands may be the signposts <clears throat> that point the way to a renewed harmonious relationship. <clears throat> and I know those are easy to say, but that's really what it's about. And you have to ask yourself, do I have a harmonious relationship with this place where I'm at? Do I have this harmonious relationship with the people that are uh, around me? Do I have a harmonious relationship between my ancestors laying in the ground and those babies who are just about ready to come up here? That's what he's talking about. He's coming, being indigenous is that, not necessarily having to be in an ancient structure. Now on the northwest coast, the rainforest, is it's the most, uh, you can see where they talk about the wonder and uh, beauty, where the moss is reclaiming everything. Yes, we see the earth is alive, but here's an example. It's exactly what it's doing. You can't tell, are these old trees or the old house posts, people living there? Everything built eventually goes back to the earth and becomes part of the earth to create that energy that produces life to renew the earth. Same with us, that's what's going to happen to us. So as you're walking through the rainforest and see all of this moss all over the place, you finally get to the water. Now I told you, they put us on a boat, and there was, a, I don't know, about a dozen of us. In fact, the boat was even bigger than this one. Kuja's in the back singing this rowing song. And we, row, we rowed out to this island right here. We got off on one side of the island and walked over on the other. Now, going out there was really quite beautiful. First time I was actually out on the ocean on that water, and I could see where this is what makes Haida's Haida because they do this. They have these songs, they, they have this tradition, they have these big boats go in the water, <clears throat> and they have these islands to reach to. And then we had to turn around and roll back, and then we're going against the tide, and it was quite a, quite a journey. But uh, this idea of making these huge boats out of the big cedar trees, we can't do that in our country. Uh, other people can't do it. So when I talked about the local ecology helps to determine the culture, that's important to remember. Kuja said this, the Haida have lived on these islands since they came out of the sea a thousand years ago. The sea is still there. There's still creatures in the sea. That's their relatives. Some of them can point out, well, that's my family over there, those kind of fish or this kind of things. And we're connected to that. And you can see nature recreating itself all the time. But not only are the creatures of the sea there, but just like us, the bears are there too. I don't know if you've ever seen a bear eat a salmon. I mean, an amazing fisherman. And what I'm getting at here is that we learn to be who we are by studying the animals in our ecology. Uh, I think Sue talked about it earlier about how, uh, you know, we have these clan things and you're not supposed to marry somebody in your clan. But and that kind of goes against nature because in nature, I've never seen a bear try to mate with a turtle. 
But in our community, that's a preferred marriage, but that's a whole other freaky thing going on there. So the culture, the people that are born out of this place, born out of this tradition, try to emulate, reflect, and respect that origin. So we'll get more to that, but that's how the, in the Northwest Coast, the, the place then of these uh, huge long, they're longhouse people too. They do their paintings. And we'll see these two, uh, you can see these two birds in there. I'll share a little bit more of them later. And of course they do produce these uh, totem poles, the largest single piece wood carving in the whole world. And he mentioned a couple of things then about why it's important to be Haida. So he says it's uh, not simply a song or dance or these images or language or even blood. He says, yeah, it's, it's all of that. But it's a waking on Haida Gwaii, waiting for the herring to spawn. It's a feeling you get when you bring to a feed of cockles to the old people or walking on barnacles or moss. So it's about being in that place. And not only that, not wanting to be anywhere else but that place. That's what makes that indigenous connection strong. That's why it's so hard to translate into art or architecture because sometimes you think we're trying to artificially create that experience and that connection. But if we're just living that connection, it will naturally flow out of that out of that living. So it's something about this bearing witness to what's going on. It's about being there, but it's also about, as he says in Latin, watching the kids grow up and attending the funeral feasts. The old people in the ground, the next one's coming up. That's what being indigenous is all about. So when you go across the Northwest Coast, you'll see this evidence, this great evidence of these ancestral um, expressions. We don't necessarily have that in our country. We don't have we don't have anything left over from our people from the 16, 1700s, <clears throat> other than the thoughts that we have. Our villages didn't last like these ones do out west. So let's take a quick journey to the southwest. <clears throat> I uh, worked in Santa Fe, New Mexico for several years <clears throat> and got to appreciate the Pueblo people. The Pueblos uh, live, uh, say, like from uh, Santa Fe up uh, to, uh, to uh, Taos. They took me to this place called Chaco Canyon on the far side of the Diné or the Navajo. And the Hopi, they kind of live together. The Hopis, are, I mean, the Navajos are kind of like the, uh, the, well, it depends. If you're a Hopi, you would say they're an interloper, meaning they moved in. The Navajos are actually direct relatives of the people from British Columbia. They speak the same language. For whatever reason, they left British Columbia. They moved their way down. They came to the Southwest. They saw how beautiful it was, and uh, they stayed there. So ironically, the Hopis, who were the original people there, are surrounded by this huge Navajo reservation, which is the largest reserve in North America. So it's a very interesting dynamic. There's also Apaches living there, different cultural groups in this area. <clears throat> and they had different ideas about what this dish was contrived of. The Pueblos, you can see here within the red uh, box, they have these four sacred mountains. So when you grow up Pueblo, you have these mountains to the north, south, east, and west. Navajos also have four sacred mountains, but there's a little bit different arrangement to, to them. So whatever those mountains help to define what the culture is. And within these uh, mountain ranges, you see the people connect and harmonize with each other, with the natural world, with the unseen world, meaning the spirits that exist, and with time itself. It truly is like going back, it's timelessness. Time seems to stand still, that when you're there doing the things that your ancestors have always done. So this is just a sketch that the, uh, the Diné or the Navajo made of their world. We can see these big mountains. Everything else takes place within it. I'm moving a little quickly through here so we can kind of keep on schedule. One of them is Mount Taylor. And in the Navajo creation story, it says that uh, the first man created these sacred mountains from soil from the fourth world. Now, in the southwest, that they believe there were other worlds here before us. And each one, because the creatures, the dominant creatures just messed up so bad, that world fell apart. <clears throat> a few of them emerged to the next world. They tried it again. That fell down. No, no, no. So out of the fourth world, some people will believe we're in the fifth world, that ancestral knowledge slowly makes its way up. But there's a lesson in there. Every time, this is before colonization, that society failed to maintain its uh, spiritual um, responsibilities, and the world collapsed. 
So they made these mountains to remind them of that great power in that ancestral world. They attached uh, powers to them. As we see this one, the black god, turquoise boy, turquoise girl, are said to reside within that mountain range. And of course, they all have uh, names according to their different uh, indigenous languages. The Southwest is a uh, sometimes a beautifully barren country. It's a very interesting, and uh, you see this, uh, this is just outside of uh, Santa Fe, this huge, uh, cultural landscape. Now, we live in the lush Carolinian forest. So part of me said, why on earth would you stop in the desert to try to grow corn? Just come on up to upstate New York. You got more corn you know what to do with. But for them, eking out corn in this very arid climate is a testament to the power of the human spirit, also the power of their belief, and the power of these unseen forces to help make that corn grow. That's kind of really interesting. So the Pueblos, as you can see here, are scattered. There's 19 northern ones that go all the way up, uh, up to, along the, uh, the uh, Rio Grande uh, River. And uh, the, each one of them, though, were started when the, uh, when the Spaniards moved in and set up a little Catholic mission in each one. So it's kind of ironic. Every Pueblo community has this Catholic church in the center of the community. <clears throat> in front of the church is a big dance plaza and we'll see why in a minute. Before the Pueblos, there was a Chaco culture. Look at how that extended from Colorado, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico. They call that the Four Corners, where those four states uh, meet. It's one of the few places in, in the US. This old Chaco culture is, is the ones who you would say uh, lived, uh, they call them Anasazi sometimes, the Chaco culture. These are the people who built these old structures right on the side of a mountain. So when you ever go to Albuquerque or Santa Fe or get up to Chaco Canyon, now I was lucky because I was uh, taken uh, there by a, a Pueblo man who was also a structural engineer. And so he's describing to me how these buildings were made because some of these are well, almost a thousand years old. They're still standing there. And it really reflects Pueblo Ness. It's also a great place of, of uh, wonder and beauty. There's these messages that were left in these rock carvings. Some of the Pueblo people and the Hopi people can uh, still try to interpret or connect to these things, but every generation has this need, this desire, to put your handprint on the landscape, do something that says, I was here, I witnessed this, I was a part of this thing here, and sometimes these unseen forces manifest themselves just long enough for you to say, and when I was here, I saw this, this creature. So these are kind of momentary diary reflections in the life of indigenous people in the Southwest. But when you go to their communities, the intensity, even though a lot of them are raised as Catholics, they also do their ceremonies, and the profound belief that they had. And here's what they say. We're doing the same dances our people have done ever since they arrived at this place. It's this landscape that we're connecting to, whether it's this deer dance, or this eagle dance, that we were told these are the things that you need to do in order to have this relationship with place, in order to maintain that. So you just need to do that. You don't need to make a building that talks about that or an exhibit that talks about that or write a textbook about that. You need to do that. But one thing you learn is not everybody's an eagle dancer. Not everybody's a good singer. So they do it on our behalf, and we appreciate what they do. But I can tell you, it's one thing to watch a dancer, that's a whole other thing to be the dancer. So being indigenous is not a spectator sport. You have to, you have to do the work. <clears throat> Cahokia, which is near uh, um, St. Louis, is a whole other trip. This is probably one of the oldest uh, settlements in, uh, although it kind of rivals what was going on in Cahokia. <clears throat> these are the mound builder people. And I say it's at the confluence of these two rivers where they come together that forms the, the mighty Mississippi. It was a huge uh, village con um, concept, as you can see here. The problem is there's no real living descendants. I can't go and say, can you take me to your old village? You know, because we don't quite know what happened to the people who lived there. There's certainly some descendancy of them. But look at how, look how big their territory was, their cultural territory. So it's kind of ironic when we say we're recognizing a certain group that were in their traditional territory. Well, what does that mean? because the mound builders were here before even the Haudenosaunee maybe in some of these areas. So we have to understand that there were ancient ancestors who walked this place, but they had a common culture that goes all the way from Florida 
actually all the way into southern Ontario. It connects with some of the uh, mounds uh, across the southern Ontario. They call it this Mississippian period. Nobody knows for sure what happened, but look at their location. If you say location, 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 where these three big rivers come together, which allowed the people in that community to have a vast trading network. That's just slightly switched over to Ohio, but it's the same idea. All these exotic materials, the marine shell from the, the uh, Gulf of Mexico to uh, obsidian from out uh, west to uh, native copper from the Great Lakes, all of that gets channeled and fueled down into this community, which also then changes the nature of the community. So some people believe the reason why it was the largest community, because it had the most access to natural materials, and it became a trading capital. Everybody came there to try to get something from that, but it was huge. Now, there have been a lot of theories about this, everything from it was space aliens that came down and built these to uh, a few lost Aztecs and Mayans showed up and said, hey, let's build a pyramid. So, uh, but this was uh, constructed over hundreds and hundreds of uh, years. And as we see here, the largest pre-contact settlement north of Mexico by 1350, after a span of three centuries, so 300 years of living in this place, Cahokia was gone. What they speculated was, was it... Um, Culture decay, did something start going on there and there's speculation that they start sacrificing humans there and it got a little, a little weird. Was it economic, uh, uh, I mean ecological uh, disaster, some can, something struck, some famine hit. When you have 20, 30,000 people living in a community and all of a sudden there's no corn, you're gonna have some trouble. Uh, was it uh, overpopulation and put a taxing on all of the systems? Nobody knows for sure what happened. So it's interesting to me because you could say this would rival, somebody mentioned earlier this morning the word civilization, but if you kind of look at it, the root, and it really talks about building cities, this maybe might rival that notion uh, the strongest, in, uh, at least in North America, of these intentional places that are built, but built with these pyramids to get something upward, up into the sky. This is the largest one left. Now they call it Monk's Mound, it's kind of misnamed because there was a few uh, Jesuits made a little uh, campment down there for a while. And I actually walked that place to go up to the top. It's, uh, it's amazing because when you think of the hundreds of years it took to build this place and then the people are gone, something happened. So it's also kind of a place of mystery making me wonder, should I really be standing here? Maybe they left here on purpose. Maybe they don't like seeing the Arch of St. Louis. Well, that's just a joke. Uh, <clears throat> So whatever this metropolis is going on here, this big trading network, they're wealthy, acres and acres of corn, all kinds of things going on there. But see their temple, as they say, is way up on top. We'll take a look at a little bit more of that later. So at its golden age, there was also, that's the temple mound, and then there was this circle of uh, poles put in the ground. They call it wooden, wood hedge after stone hedge in, uh, over in you know, Europe. And they say it turned to be like a celestial, um, I mean, uh, so at the solstice, as the sun breaks over that monk's mound, the center pole aligns up. So it's like a, a, a sundial, it's a huge thing going on there. And they found out they built this probably about five different times, which is interesting to me, in, in related but just slightly off locations. Because as we know now, the rotation of the earth is changing. And in 300 years in that place, they found out, well, they line up here at one year, and then maybe 100 years later, it lines up over here. Another 100 years lines up a little bit differently. So even the sundial was an active change. So this, to this very day, people gather out there on the winter and summer solstice to witness this, although the mound has changed a little bit. But it's really a, um, quite an emotional event when you think that humans at that place that long ago crea created this environment, uh, this uh, architecture that reminded us of the most primal of activities, of the movement of the sun and what that would signal to the people who depend on it. Now, as I say, the Haudenosaunee, <clears throat> our place is in the center of the cornfield. Uh, Sue talked a little bit about this. Yes, it's true we're people of the longhouse, but what made us able to build that longhouse, in addition to a seeking peace, was the fact that we grew so much corn. And it gave a predominant role for women in that e uh, economy 
and therefore women had a hard, larger role in the society and the politics of it all because they're the economic engine of the Haudenosaunee. And as it turns out, our place, as we can see down in uh, New York, the five nations originally, I'm a Tuscarora, we're the sixth nation, we joined that uh, bunch when we got hungry for corn in 1715. And, uh, but we're surrounded by other Iroquoian-speaking people. So what we are, as you can see here, uh, within a neutral territory, there are other people around us, but then these St. Lawrence Iroquoians, they go all the way out to head it out towards uh, that Mi'kmaq country that we talked about. So my ancient ancestors are connected to all of that uh, space. <clears throat> and we mentioned this uh, message of peace. So I did this painting to try to visualize what it would be like at the moment where the peacemaker delivers this great wampum belt to our people. That wampum belt becomes a visual manifestation of our architectural premise. We are people of the longhouse, building the longhouse. Five nations living under one roof, under one law. Five uh, nations of people try to speak with one the voice. So the wampum design becomes our roadmap to what our houses are supposed to be like. But you also have to look at the geology. So here's a New York State, and it's a thin ribbon. You can see the river, the, the Mohawk River, that runs all the way, uh, or it starts in Schenectady, and connects all the way across that path. It turns out that little ribbon of green is probably one of the most productive soils for growing corn in North America. Wait, is it weird? So are we fortunate to be born there, or did the place attract it to us? Did it work out so well? That's what allowed our communities to grow strong. It's this beautifully rich soil in those places. I'm fortunate that we don't have that at Grand River, but down there in the old home country, that's what it was. But remember what I said, what is the soil? It's everything that once lived before. All of the birds, the plants, the animals, the deer, the fish, and our relatives, they put in the ground, and they get recycled, it re and comes back up, and it then allows new things to be born. From the sky world, that's where people came from, as uh, Bill showed in his uh, uh, presentation, they say they brought these corn seeds down from up there. They were gifted to us. They brought squash seeds, and they brought uh, beans down with them. And those become the things that allow us to live, but they can't grow unless you have this fertile soil. So you can see how it gets uh, interdependent. So a lot of people call these the three sisters, but we refer to them as those that sustain our life. And boy, do they ever. This great bounty, when you think about it, one little seed put in the ground, and it produces uh, a whole meal. And our corn stalks used to be up to uh, 15, 18 feet tall. One ear of corn, 24 inches tall. Hopi corn only grows about four feet tall, and you know why? Because the Hopis are only about three and a half feet tall. If it was up this tall, they couldn't pick corn. But anyway, uh, corn connects us all. <laughs> there are no Hopis here, are there? Okay. <laughs> but in order to process that corn, you need hardwood trees. And here's some people standing around an old growth hardwood tree. Now, old growth, I don't know, can have many meanings today. Let's just say that's a huge tree. You need the hardwood to produce ashes that you use to cook the corn. Otherwise, you can't. it's hard to cook that corn. So, when you're going to establish a village, you look for hardwood trees. Uh, you've got to throw a little meat in the soup. So uh, we like a deer meat and venison that we believe was gifted to us as a sacred food. But if you want to establish your village, you've got to look then where the acorn trees are. Because where there's acorns, there's deer. So we kind of like survey the landscape to say what's going on in this particular region. And if you want to add healthy, add healthy fish oil to your diet, you've got to be where there's water. In our country, compared to Hopi country, we're, we've got an overabundance of water. And in the old days when it was all clear, full of fish, they talk, when the Jesuits first arrived, they talked about being able to walk across some of these lakes on the, back, the salmon were so full and so big, you could walk across the lake by stepping on the back of the salmons. All right, the Jesuits exaggerate a little bit, you know, but uh, the idea, <laughs> yes. They were full of fish and adding to our diet. And Haudenosaunee country is also uh, beautiful, full of wonder. This is a falls yeah, near Letchworth in Seneca country. A lot of people don't associate this kind of thing with Niagara Falls, I mean with uh, Haudenosaunee country. But there's a world above and there's a world below, and we'll take a look at that a little bit later. Let's talk now about the space. When I was in Haida country, I called it the space between two birds, because in the, in the community I was in, 
There are people of the Raven Clan and people of the Eagle Clan. We were all there kind of lusting after eagle feathers, you know, it's, a, it's an addiction we have, we can't help it. And so um, the eagle people were very accommodating. We said, well, yeah. But the raven people got kind of jealous, they got angry with us. So they came to perform one night at dinner, and this guy came out there in this outfit, it's a raven outfit, and he had this wooden mask that was almost as long as this table. And they're dancing around, and this thing comes slamming down like this. So at first they thought, why are they angry? And then what I realized is they're saying, we're here too. And you native people from outside are honoring the eagles, that's good, but don't forget, you gotta honor us ravens as well. So I thought that was funny. So on this little art shop in uh, one of their communities, we see the eagle and the raven depicted on the front of that door. They're honoring both. And this is uh, one of their contemporary longhouses, their ceremonial buildings. So in the midst of that place between the ocean and the rainforest, the hiders are crafting out a space in which they demonstrate to the, to the ocean and the forest, we still remember who we are. We're still gonna do those dances to honor what took place here, to recall our relatives in the water and in the forest and up in the air, and we're gonna do things to help enrich our children's thinking that they would not, would not wanna be anywhere else in the world but right here. This is back when it all used to work. It's really great. And if you know anything then about the architectural design, these are huge. These are long houses, huge uh, cedar poles. Uh, as you see, they're usually carved with the uh, kind of like the family crests of the uh, people inside there. But there was this interesting one, even though it's not uh, a Haida, the one on the right. It's this house post where the door is carved in the belly of the bear. So that literally the bear clan people of that house, you'll go in, it's like you're going back into the birth canal of the bear. You come out, that's where you come out. So the architecture helps you relive your concept of creation. On the Haida uh, office building and the other, I mean, uh, another ceremony longhouse, they have the doors. Can you just see those two ovals carved on either side for the people to enter? But it's still this idea. So metaphorically, you're going into this internal space, just like the mother's womb, where all of that groovy things uh, happen, where you learned about what culture really meant. And then when you come out into the, into the larger world, you bring all of that stuff with you. So this is why it's so important to the Haida people to recover their uh, great uh, art of uh, carving, of uh, these big canoe making, and then when you see them dance. Yes, yeah, some, some of it's made with trade material like the trade wool and these uh, mother of pearl uh, blankets, but when they dance, it says, this, remember what I talked about, this timelessness? You're there thinking, for as long as Haida's have been here in the world, they've been doing this kind of dance, they've been singing these kind of songs, they've been raising their kids to do this kind of stuff, so when you see those little wee kids get up, put on that button blanket and march out there and start dancing. It's a joy that can't be replicated by any building. And then we gotta remember though, and not everything has to have this big profound meaning. This is some sculptures by Bill Reed, it's actually down in the Canadian Embassy down in Washington, and uh, what he, he called it the spirit canoe. He said it wasn't designed to have any overall meaning in a, in a literal sense. I thought it was a good opportunity to repay all the funny little characters who have been posing for me <clears throat> by taking them for a ride in the family canoe. So he's just honoring all of that stuff that inspired him, and apparently he got inspired by a dog's rear end, but anyway, that's, uh, that's Uncle Bill. Now let's take a look at the space in the Pueblo country. The Pueblos uh, somehow are able to craft in a community out of rock, out of desert, out of high mesa. This is Acoma, it's one of the oldest continuously occupied communities in North America. The Pueblo people are still living in the kind of buildings their ancestors built that we saw in Chaco Canyon. Everywhere you go in the Southwest, this style of architecture, it's a living architecture. It doesn't necessarily need improvement. It doesn't need modernization. It doesn't need um, a concern for sustainability because it sustained them for 2,000 years. But more could be done uh, to that. This was the building I actually worked in. It was an old uh, post office modeled after a quasi-Pueblo style. They call it Pueblo Revival, but it really should have been Caucasian Revival of Pueblo tradition. But uh, <laughs> my job was to transform this into a museum. But it had a historical designation, so we could only adjust the architecture so much we had to keep the historic character of this building, which I think was originally built in 1912. But when I got to Chaco Canyon and I realized 
how ancient that tradition was that the Pueblos had. In Chaco Canyon, is, there were several uh, uh, communities built there. Now, not much is left because this is, again, like 900 years old, but you can see this network of these little small rooms, oops, little small rooms, a big dance plaza, the white space, and then these huge circular spaces. Those are called kivas. It's an underground chamber, uh, usually a ceremonial chamber would take place. This, now, this one is particularly huge. So when I was there with my Pueblo engineer friend, and he's explaining to me how it all works, how they got air down into there to make a fire, how some of them even had uh, uh, secret passageways so that their priests, as they call them, could, could emerge into this space and then do their thing and then also reemerge out. The little spaces around the outside wall are for uh, offerings. And you go there today, you'll still see the things that Pueblo people live there, even, I mean, leave there. They don't live there, but they leave their offerings into this beautiful landscape. The Pueblos, like the Hopis that I mentioned, believe there was a world below us, and we emerged from that world into this world. And in parts of the Southwest landscape, you could actually reimagine that. You could stand in those places, say, this is what it must have looked like when those beings were coming into this world. So their architecture doesn't have to duplicate it exactly, but does, it does conceptually. So there are spaces in this huge complex where you have these vistas all the way up into the sky to honor that emergence from the world below. And then everywhere you go in Pueblo country, you've got to be careful because there's these ladders to go into the space below called these uh, kivas. So one time I went to visit the Hopis and they uh, took me over there. And you're always nervous when you visit uh, other people as to what's proper. Part of me said, no, I shouldn't go down there because it's not of us. But then my hosts were saying, no, we want you to go down there. And I couldn't understand why this guy was insisting we go down there. So anyway, the Kiva is the most beautiful place that I've been at. Bill talked about that shaft of light. So, But down, now you're underground in the Mesa. It's very cool. Very ancient stone, even ancient logs. And that shaft of light comes down. So imagine you're there crawling down that ladder backwards, enter into that Kiva space. That's what I had to do. When I got down there, there was this old Hopi man sitting there. He was smoking. Just like an Indiana Jones, you know, you watch this smoke come up in the sunlight and I was expecting, I don't know, something to happen. He couldn't speak English, so my tour guide, who was a Hopi man, was translating for him. And he, he introduced us, the Haudenosaunee from New York State. And this old man, you saw him, he looked at us, he looked at each one of us, he shook our hands, and then he started talking in his language. And as he was talking, I see this little tear running down his uh, cheek. And what he said was, um, I'm so happy that you're here because it proves that what my grandfather told me is true. He says, one day, these light-skinned natives from the east are going to come to Hopi country. They're going to come down in the Kiva, and, and we're going to greet them, and we're going to reunify the indigenous spirit of the Americas. He says, because we're meant to be one people. So when people say, that's their culture and their place out in Hopi country. We have ours in Haudenosaunee country. Part of me says my real life experience is it's not true. The Hopis are our relatives. That space was created for us to go there to meet them, to renew this thing because they said the future of the world depends on the indigenous people getting their spiritual power back together again. So when you see that, you realize, okay, it's a culturally defined place. But that thing that happened there affected me in the rest of my life. That couldn't have happened anywhere else. So these kivas are these great places all over the place. And they give an idea of the architecturally how, how huge they are, the way they're designed. Circular space. Some of them are square, rectangular. It's the idea of the underground, connecting the powers underground with this emergence into this visible world. This is the way the Hopis, uh, I mean, uh, the Pueblo people greet you. It's the way they offer their prayers. They're, they, they're from their mind, they're giving thanks to the powers to be. Then they would blow in their hands because it represents the breath of the Creator. I don't know what indigenous people don't understand that when you see this happening. You don't need to describe it all. We all have a different way of doing that, but we all do the same thing. Now, let's try to examine what took place at Cahokia because it's a place of mystery. Scientists say they began to sacrifice humans way up on top there. And it kind of sounded like a Hollywood movie to me, but uh, when you start looking at the evidence, they, so they tried to create this idea. They had these, the peon people, commoners, had the leaders, 
the elite class, and then you had the great chief, the sun king, the one who was descendant from the sun. And in order to keep things going well, they would take some of the commoners, and sometimes they would execute them in honor of the sun king. So you see the physical evidence, you'll see the, a noble buried there, and around him are buried several dozen commoners, and sometimes a few dogs, and their feet are cut off, or sometimes their heads cut off, and you wonder, oh man, what's going on here? Part of me, I didn't want to believe the stories, but maybe this is also why this society failed. So get this, Cahokia begins to disappear the minute our peacemaker emerges in the landscape. And what does the peacemaker say? Stop killing each other. Stop hurting each other. No more bloodshed. Maybe, because we are one people in the beginning, our message of peace was to stop what was taking place at a place like Cahokia. I'm not saying that it is, I'm just makes me wonder. Because of the speculation, because we can't turn around and go talk to anybody from there. Their stories only exist in the archaeological record. And it's a great place of mystery, but only because we don't know what the oral tradition is. But they did leave some very interesting evidence. So carvings of this person, they, they call him the falcon man or the falcon impersonator. Can you see the guy on the left? He's made out of native copper. So we see this man with a little copper beak, big feathered cape, he's holding a club in one hand, and it looks like a severed head in the other hand. But if you examine a record a little closely, it's actually a rattle in the shape of a human head. So it would be easy to misinterpret that, that he severed the head. There could be a whole other thing going on. But you know, archaeologists kind of like, they get a little ghoulish, that's all I can say. There's no archaeologists here, are there? But then there's a lot of speculation that the falcon man, somebody then took that design and looked up into the stars and began to map that it's possible that that way the stars are, that's where people saw the falcon man. And so they took that, gave it physical manifestation. Now, I'm not saying this is true, but it's interesting. This is one of my favorite pieces of work that I've, uh, it's at the National Museum of American Indian, and I uh, put it on uh, display in New York City one time. It's a round circle. One hand we have this eagle. The other hand we have this, this serpent, this plume serpent. And if there's anything that connects the ideology, the Anishinaabek and the Haudenosaunee, is that there's these two realms, the world above, where the eagle, or the thunderbird flies, and the world below, where the serpent is. How much time do I have left? Oh, sorry. No, we're going to have to suspend everything. You guys are enjoying this too much, so let's keep going. No, <laughs> just kidding. And we don't know what it's for, and we don't know how it's actually worn. But if you turn it just slightly, where the single hole is, then all of a sudden you get that manifestation of the worldview. The eagle and the serpent in constant struggle. And who's in the middle? <laughs> Microphones. <laughs> who's in the middle? But humans. And our conduct will determine which one of those two things might have some dominance over the other. You didn't realize you had so much power, did you? So the reason why we continue to do ceremonies, try to maintain that harmonious balance that Bill Reed talked about, is to keep the world working. Not just our little place, not just to make the corn grow, but make sure that the world works the way that it's supposed to work. That's interesting. And then I found a few carvings like this one here. I found a few images of a, a nursing mother that I found in indigenous country that kind of belay that notion that these are headhunters executing people. I don't know, so I'm, I'm still not sure. But a lot of it's conjecture about them. But I got to ask the question, OK, what about the modern mound builders? the people who are making landfills. This is a landfill out in California. Imagine a thousand years from now, we're going back, archaeologists are digging this stuff up, trying to figure out who were these people. Look at all this stuff that they're doing, you know? And why is it that they didn't live as if the earth mattered? Well, that's assuming there's even going to be archaeologists a thousand years from now if we keep going the way we do. So I think there's the difference between the two, though, is that indigenous cultures are that mirror upon which we can reflect on our own conduct but they can also be the window through which we recraft our conduct to make it in line with this land here uh, because of that energy vibrating stuff from our ancestors I talked about. It's, it's here. So you all are part of that. For the Haudenosaunee, and I will wrap this up pretty quick, we believe we exist under this sky dome, this huge dome. <clears throat> 
that picture he showed, those longhouses were up above that dome. The plane that we see here, that's actually the water, the ocean. There's a turtle that's supposed to earth. There's a whole water world underneath that turtle. So it's no coincidence then when we build our homes, they usually had an arched roof because that represents that sky dome above us, represents the mound of earth that the corn and beans and squash grow out of. It represents the shape of our head. All of that is to remind us that's what we're connected to. Now the sky dome has a hole in it, and I have met some Mohawks have a hole in their head, but that's a whole other story. Uh, so uh, this is a, a drawing by um, uh, a young man who uh, shows this depiction of this woman on the back of the turtle and when the sky dome. So this curve becomes a representation of our culture. We'll see it over and over again. So you can see then how the sky dome as an art pattern gets reflected in the architecture of our uh, people, that we exist under this dome. So the idea, though, is you make a longhouse from where the sun rises to where it sets. All humans are related under that sky dome, all of us. And so that's, I think, an important distinction between looking at Haudenosaunee as connected just a simple place versus realizing the Turtle Island is our place. And our villages were quite uh, famous, as uh, we saw. I think the longest longhouse I've seen on record is about 440 feet long. That's huge when you think about it. You're living in there with all your female relatives. And I often wonder, now that I've become an old man, what it would be like in the middle of the winter if you lived 220 feet in there and you had to go to the bathroom really bad. That's quite a journey <laughs> through <laughs> all your relatives' living room. So I think this is maybe why some of those pots were extra large. And uh, Gerardo's going to talk a little bit more about the nature of space within the longhouse, so I won't get to that much, but you're living there that smoke hole is a symbol of that entry to the world above that we talked about, that's just like in the kiva, it's just a little different, and that this longhouse was many families, many related families, living under one roof and living in peace. That's an important part of that. So when I went to Crawford Lake, this is one of my daughters uh, standing there. I actually got 10 children all together because I figured you can't have indigenous art or indigenous rights unless you have indigenous children, so I made a whole bunch of them. And um, <laughs> when I asked her, What's it like to be Haudenosaunee? Of course, after visiting this, what did she do? She, she went like this, that it's this huge space in which we become ourselves. And I thought that was very significant. So I started off asking the question, how is it that uh, uh, space, place becomes important to indigenous people? And we've seen some examples of that, but also you have to realize this is what we're fighting about. This is why we fight so hard today. It's protect our relationship to that place. So these are some Haida people that are doing this sort of protest about what's going on with the waters, about how the, uh, the oil companies are polluting our waters, about how the timber companies are destroying uh, the forest, how suburban growth is demanding more and more out of this environment. You've got to ask the question, how many more toilets can we afford to flush? How, how, many, how much more highways do we need? How many more pipelines do we need? And so indigenous people are stuck because we live with the reality of this stuff is necessary, but we live with this old reality that seemed to be more, more like the, that's our empirical truth. And when we start living out of balance with that, we become part of the problem. So I think this generation of indigenous people are trying to say, how do we restore our connection to place? And the only way we can do that is to build the kind of indigenous space in our family, in our homes, in our community that makes our children feel so empowered that there's no place else in the world I'd rather be than right here where I'm meant to be. And I think when we start seeing all of the social uh, decay taking place uh, because of colonization, residential schools, it threatens that very notion. But when I was a kid, you go to the longhouse and there was maybe 20, 30 people there, mostly old people. Today, you go to our longhouses where our ceremonies take place. If you're not there an hour before, you won't even get a seat. The place is just full of people, full of young people, full of young women with their kids. And then when you see people get up to dance, you see, you know, see the older ones and then the intermediate ones, and then you see these little wee ones, the dancing. That, to me, is indigenous joy to say, that at least for one more generation, it's going to continue. But I think we have to help to use your technology some of your methodologies, some of your science, 
to say, how can we recraft that indigenous space in such a way that it empowers the indigenous spirit? So that's what I have to share with you today. So thank you very much, Tony.